very grateful for God. Seven years her grandson has spent in prison due to some situations that God's forgiven and it's all over and he is getting released June 7th and, and uh, we've had a part in requesting his pardon and she's so grateful to God and he was just a little skinny old boy and now he's coming with a big, as, a, as a man now and uh, serving God, God has a way to get us to serve him, doesn't he? And we're proud of him and just, I just want to say that he's being released and uh, a lot of us are bound up in a prison ourselves, and we need released in our emotions and in our hearts. And he has been freed both ways, and it's going to be freed both ways. So, Francis, I just love you. I just want to say we all rejoice when those good things happen uh, in our families, don't we? So, amen? Just felt like saying that today. God bless you. Romans chapter 8, we are building our faith together. And uh, this is a series that we've talked about, turning on the switch because you can't get things activated without faith. And I was thinking of a, of a song. I've been a pastor for many years. I'm not saying I'm old. But for many years I've pastored. Actually, a senior pastor, a lead pastor, 36 years I have been a lead. That's not counting when I was a youth pastor. I don't try to figure it out. The math means nothing at certain points of your life. It's just the devil. 36 years. And uh, wow, that's amazing. But in those years, I have preached a lot of messages on faith. But never have I had to, to use, use it so quickly <laughs> as I did this week. It was like the day after God said, okay, you preached good, sonny boy. Let's practice it. And all kinds of things went through this week. How many have weeks like that? There are moments that your faith has to be stronger than others. So you better be putting some deposit in you so that when you need it, you can make a withdrawal. Sometimes I have preached faith, and I preached it because I had experienced things before I preached it, beforehand. Sometimes I preached it, and afterwards, I pre after I preached it, I have to live it. But you don't get to preach stuff without living, and I want you to know that. Don't have, so I'd like to be able to talk. No, you wouldn't, because you're accountable for everything you say, and God says, let's try it out, buddy. And it's good, and I'm so grateful for it. But I tell you what, there was a lot of challenges this week, and there still are. But I have the strangest, weirdest peace as I'm preaching this because we are not just having moments of faith. I want you to know you've got to live by faith. There's an old song that <laughs> sometimes I, I have such a background in God that it dips down into the old and it just I start singing some old hymn that I don't even like the melody anymore because it's so outdated but it, I can't get away from it some of that stuff shaped my life more than preaching did I forget the sermons but I always forget some of those old songs we used to sing you know what I mean and this one I was laying in bed and I was thinking of the week that I'd gone through and the faith that I expressed to God and it's just an old song that says living by faith we said those words in one of the songs this morning beautiful worship list the day Remember this, anybody? It says, I care not today what the morning may bring. These words still make me. I, I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worries are vain. The chorus said, living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm, safe in his sheltering arms. I'm living by faith, and I feel no alarm. The next verse said, Though tempests may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life, I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. The Master looks on at the strife. I know that He safely will carry me through. Somebody say amen. No matter what evils betide, why should I then care though the tempests may blow if Jesus walks close? by my side because I'm living by faith in Jesus above trusting confiding in his great love from all harm safe in his sheltering arms I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm wow living by faith not just spurts of moments of faith but I live by faith in fact everything you do ought to be by faith Lord, speak to us as we begin to read the word here today. Add your blessing to this reading and our study as we wind the service up today and get a faith lift from your word in Jesus' name. 
Romans chapter 8, a few verses again continuing in this series. I'd like to start with the fifth verse, please, and go to the 11th. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And again, I remind you that when we say flesh, we are talking about just your ability, your fleshly ability. We're not talking about just carnal, sexual, passionate. We're talking about your ability, your strength. So if you live according to your strength, you've been thinking about your strength. You've been thinking of the things that you can do and how you're going to do it. But if you're saying, God, how can you work this out? It will be according to the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, fleshly minded, self-minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Now carnal again just means in your own strength. What you see, feel, touch, you know what I mean. And the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. I underlined those words as I studied that yesterday. What you do in yourself cannot make it by itself. It cannot do what God wants to do. It cannot be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. How many of you know you're Christians? Christ dwells in you through the Holy Spirit. You got to know who you are. And if anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, he's not of his. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit of life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your old stinking mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. Whew, that gives me hope. Amen. I need his spirit. You may be seated. Praise God. You know, there, we've learned in our series here that there are two parts to the Christian experience. Just real quick, couple of things just to set the pace for what I want to say today. Two parts of the Christian experience, and we said that they are summed up in four words. I don't want you to forget this, so I just want to say it one more time. You're coming to Christ. The four words are Jesus in my place. Everybody say, Jesus in my place. It's not what you did. It's what he did for you. Amen? You've got to remember that. He did it for you. It's the finished work of Christ on the cross that gives us anything. So coming to Christ, your salvation, you become a Christian because of Jesus in my place. But we don't just stop when we come to Christ. Then we must grow in Christ. That's what you're supposed to be doing right now. Sadly, people come to Christ, say, that's it. I've got the fire insurance and everything. I signed up for the fire insurance. Don't want to go to hell. I've, you know, I've got the fire insurance and that's it. No, 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 no. You've got to grow in Christ. And growing in Christ is also summed up in four words. How do I grow or live for Christ? Not I, but Christ. Those four words. Would you say them with me? Not I, but Christ. Say them again. You can't do it yourself. And we broke that down into three parts. I'd like to give them to you one more time this morning. The, the first one was living like Christ or for Christ is not difficult. It's impossible. You can't do it by yourself. You were never meant to do it by yourself. It's not I, but Christ now that lives in me. And that's a hard thing to understand. And we'll get to it a little bit more in this series. If you're living for God, you're living the exhausted life instead of the exchanged life. So it's very important that you know you can't do it by yourself. That's in verse 8 of Romans. It says those who are in the flesh can't please God. You try to do it by yourself, you cannot please God. It's just not going to work that way. Secondly, how do I do it then? Number two, living by the Holy Spirit is our only power source. You can't do it in your strength. You've got to have the Holy Spirit living within you. That's why he put Christ in you, the Holy Spirit. And that's why we also need to be prayed to be filled with the Spirit. By the way, it's also Pentecost Sunday today where we honor the fact that Christ didn't leave us without the power. He sent the Holy Spirit power on the day of Pentecost, and every believer should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. So that's a very important word. You are, you, those that are in the flesh can't please God, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. 
We, some said, how much power is this? I believe the power is in me, but I'm not feeling very much. Well, it tells us in verse 11, if the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he will help you quicken your mortal body to live for him. How many of you know raising the dead of Jesus, the body of Jesus from the dead is a pretty lot of power? Do you believe that that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and will help you? Some of you need to know it, though. You don't just need to believe it. You need to experience it. Amen? That's the answer. And the third thing that I wanted to say is that the way the switch for the power comes on is our faith. And that's what this series is. Faith is the switch that turns the power of the Holy Spirit on. You must live and walk and activate your faith. I used a phone app up here. It could be a flashlight, anything. You can have that power. Can the batteries are be fully charged, but if you don't flip the switch, you won't get any light. Many of you have power dwelling in you. You have the Holy Spirit within you, but you won't manifest any power if you don't turn on the switch. Hebrews chapter 4, we looked at that last, that was the very last scripture that we had in our message last Sunday. Hebrews chapter 4 makes all the difference and helps us understand a few things. I'd like for us to look at that. Hebrews 4, and I'd like us to look first in our New King James, and then I want to look in the NIV translation as well. This could be one of the major problems many people have, so get it again. It says, indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them. We hear the same word today. Some are going to receive something. And some are going to literally have their lives changed because they receive it. Others are going to hear the same word, but it does nothing for them. Say amen if you understand what I'm talking about. What's the difference? Verse 2, chapter 4 tells us. The word which they heard did not profit them. Profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. How you hear the word is very, very important. How you read the word is very, very important. In fact, sometimes it's worse to come and just listen and not activate your faith than to hear it at all. Because you're getting a form of godliness but not having any power. You're hearing the truth, but the truth isn't setting you free. You're going through religious motions, but it's doing you absolutely no good. And sad to say, people think, well, I went to church today. That doesn't mean anything if you don't activate your faith in church to receive what you're getting. And then you don't just believe it. You walk out and you practice it. Because if you believe it or say you believe it and you don't do it, you don't really believe it. So that's the key. Listen with intensity and openness. They heard it. But it did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. Let's look at that in the NIV translation for just a moment. It says, for we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. They weren't like the faith of those who obeyed, who didn't just hear it, but obeyed it. Get the difference? So it's so important that we realize that. Now, let's dig down even just a little bit deeper here. There's three basic principles of uh, our statements about faith in the Bible that I want to share with you just briefly. And I'm going to go quickly today, but yet we've got several, a couple of other messages on it. First of all, your purpose in life, you have individual purposes, but here's a foundational truth of the Bible. The foundational truth of the Bible is about the glory of God. Now, I want to wake you up this morning because if you think that you are the basic truth about the Bible, the Bible's about you, you're wrong. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. It's about giving God the glory. It's about the creator being honored by the created. That's what the Bible's about. How do we honor him? How do we give him glory? The Bible says everything is here for the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. We are to live for the glory of God. Christians today think that God is here for them, but no, we're here for him. We have, if you come to church so you can get your fix, so that you can get your blessing, so that you can just get what you want, that's not all it is. That's true when we seek him. He adds all these things to us, but he said seek him first. Look to him first. Give him glory. So the foundational truth of the Bible is about the glory of God. Everything is here for the glory of God. Everything exists for the glory of God. We were created for him. He's not created for us. Are you with me? 
The second thing that we need to understand is the urgent mess, or, or yeah, or the urgent. No, no, that's number no, number two, number three. I'm sorry. The second thing here is that the central theme of the Bible is the redemptive work of Christ. That the way we give God glory is to know that Christ died for us and took our place. You know the story of what we're talking about here. That's the foundational truth. And then the, the, the central theme is the redemptive work of Christ. And then thirdly, there's an urgent message. The next thing is that the benefit of the Redeemer are accessed only by faith. And this is the message that we're on. If you want the benefits of these things, if you want to receive everything the Redeemer came to give you, prosperity and health and blessing and grace and all the things that are yours, it comes by what? Faith. They're not just dumped on you. They come by faith. And it's important that we grasp that faith. Now, Hebrews 11 is someplace, if you're going to talk about faith, eventually you got to get to Hebrews 11 if you're going to study faith. And I want you to look at some of these things from there because only by faith is anything going to come into your life. And so many times we think that we just believe in this, we have a mental ascent, but faith is spiritual, not just mental. And we got to understand it a little bit. Every good thing God wants to give you comes through faith. Faith is the power switch that turns the Holy Spirit's power on in your life. And that's the urgent message in the whole Bible. If you want to say, could you give me some scriptures? I mentioned Hebrew 11, but you might write this down if you want to access the scriptures about faith. Here it is. Write down the whole Bible. That's the scriptures on faith. Everything in the Bible is about faith. It's all about faith. God wants to give us so many good things, but none of them come except through faith. Now, Hebrew 11 contains a comprehensive treatment of that truth. And uh, verse 6 basically says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So that's kind of important. Can you say amen? That's, that's pretty straightforward. Do you want to be a godly husband that would please God, but not without faith? You can do all kinds of things, but if you do them without faith, you're not pleasing God. It's not just what you do, it's that you also have faith in God while you do it that he'll bless it and he'll honor it. Amen? So, first of all, I want you to get this one too. Nothing, absolutely nothing, has nothing to do with faith. Nothing, nothing you can tell me has nothing to do with faith. Everything has to do with faith. And it's very important to get that. You say, well, what does that mean? The whole point of Hebrews 11 is the universal necessity of faith. So I guess what I'm trying to say, you don't have a separate drawer for a spot for not to do with God things. There's not a drawer in your mind that you say, now these don't have to do with God. Everything has to do with God. Everything must be done by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So there's not a possible burden that you have that doesn't require faith as your resource for victory. Nothing has nothing to do with faith. Now, in showing you that, I'd just like to look through the scriptures for a moment. Ele Hebrews 11, as I mentioned, is the Reader's Digest story of faith in the Old Testament. The writers of scripture just kept pounding the same nail over and over. And I don't know about you, I like it when they do that because I kind of have a thick head and I don't get it quick unless they, you know, just one little scripture doesn't do it. I like them to just pound it to where I can't miss it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Hebrews 11 is like that. It talks to us about faith. Let's just glance at a few of the passages real quickly. Hebrews 11, uh, you, you can see if you can pick up on the repetition of what uh, the Holy Spirit's trying to pound into us here. Verse 4 tells us that Abel offered to God a more, or, or, or he offered to God a more excellent sacrifice or offering than Cain. How did he do that? How come his offering was accepted and the other ones wasn't? By faith, it says. He did it by faith, with faith. You gave your offering today. I hope you gave it by faith. I hope you did it with faith that you will get a harvest if you plant a seed. If you didn't and you went, oh, brother, you got to put the faith in there. Amen? That's very important. So Abel offered to God a more excellent offering than Cain by faith. Verse 5, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Wow, what a phenomenal experience. He literally was caught up. How did he do that? How did that happen? By faith. His faith was so strong, God just took him up. Woo! That's an experience, isn't it? Look at verse 7. Noah, 
being divinely warned of things, not yet seen, moved with godly fear, he prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Great move, Noah. How did you do that? By faith. He couldn't do it any other way but by faith. Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he didn't know what, where, where he was even going, but he knew he would receive a her an inheritance. And verse 8 says, And he went out not knowing where he was going, and that took a lot of courage to do what God says and not knowing where you're going or what you're doing. How did he do it, folks? Give me the answer. By faith, believing that God had something for him. In verse 11, Sarah, his wife, herself, struggling with infertility, which many couples do today. She received strength to conceive seed. She bore a child even though she was past the age. And how did you do that, Sarah? What's the answer? Everything. If you look through verses 17 through 21, I, I don't have time to go. It was by faith, by faith, by faith. Everybody say it. By faith. Verses 23 on through 31, there's all kinds of things. When Moses was born, I love the story of Moses. He was hidden three months by his parents. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. Verse 23 tells us, when he was hidden by his parents in the bush, bulrushes for, for, and hidden for three months, it was done by faith. Then Moses honored his parents' example, and by faith, Moses, it says, refused to be called the son of, of Pharaoh's daughter, verse 24. And how many parents often wonder, will my children follow my faith? Will my children pick up my faith? And we find that Moses did follow that faith and believed. And by faith, he did it. He forsook Egypt by faith. Kept the Passover, it says, verses 25 through 29, by faith. They passed through the Red Sea, the children of Israel, by faith. All of that took place by faith. These victories, when they went into the promised land, were by faith. The walls fell down in Jericho when they got in the prom right before the promised land for seven days by faith. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe. Everything was by faith. Anybody hearing how we're supposed to be living? And... The writer of Hebrews here just says, you know, this is taking me too long. Let me just kind of summarize this whole thing. So verses 32 through 39, I want to read those quickly. He just sum summarized the thing. He, he just goes off on faith for these next few verses. I mean, he just goes off on it with these rapid-fire succession hits of this was done by faith and that was done. Look at it. It says, what more shall I say? For the time would not fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women's received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of change and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, and all of these having a good testimony through faith. Through faith. Do you see faith is not a part of the Christian life? It, it's the whole thing. That's why I said you want to find a scripture on faith, the whole Bible. Faith is not something, oh, I need to work on my faith. No, faith is the Christian life. When you lose your faith, you've lost your Christian life. Faith is everything. Have faith available when you need it to pull from and to draw from, deposit it in your life. It is not a part of the Christian life again. It is the whole thing. Now, reading some things about faith, check out some of these following things. A lot of scripture today, you, you believe in the Bible, don't you? Let's look at it just quickly, just a couple of things, just very quick drops into his. Check out some of the following verses in the gospel. It says, then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, let it be to you. The idea that we are in our life, the idea is that we are where we're at, are in our lives, and we're experiencing what we're experiencing, seeing either joy or victory or all of these things, and it's all according to that scripture, according to the measure of our faith. It's what the word says. Jesus answered and said to her, Matthew 15, 28, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Jesus also talked to us about the consequences of lacking faith. 
He says in Matthew 16, 8, O you of little faith, why do you reason among yourself because you brought no bread? His followers were upset because they didn't have any lunch, and he had just prior to that fed 5,000 people, and they were already saying, well, what about us? How many of you know if God could do it for them, he can do it for you? But yet we're like that, aren't we? And he looked to them in Matthew 14 or 17, 20. He was like, guys, don't you get it? Where's your faith? And then he said, because of your unbelief, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. That's what the Word of God teaches. Again, I'm going to ask you, do you believe the Word of God today? Mark 2, 5 says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven you. Do you need your sins forgiven? By faith, that'll happen. Mark 4 and 40, he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? From Mark eleven twenty two, 22, Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. I love that. The disciples were asking him some questions and he said, hey, just have faith in God. Have faith in God. Very important. How important was the faith to the disciples? Look at the two other verses in the gospel according to Luke here. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. How many of you say that's my prayer this morning? Increase our faith. It's like they were starting to get it. It's like they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, I think we're kind of getting to figure this out. It's faith, isn't it? That's what you're looking for. You're, it, it's about faith. And Jesus says, yeah. And so once they grasped it and they were beginning to understand what he was saying, they said, increase our faith. Increase our faith. That's the whole thing. It's faith. And they were beginning to understand that. In fact, I want you to grasp this. The question when Jesus comes is not, did God answer prayer? Jesus, when he comes back to this earth, here's the question it says that he's going to be asking. This is in Luke 18, verse 8. Later, he asked, after they said, increase our, esky, uh, increase our faith, he said this. When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, that's interesting because in the last days before he comes, perilous times will be here. That means there's going to be a trying of our faith in the last days. And when he comes and breaks through and the end comes, what's he going to be looking for? Will he find you believing or doubting? His true people will have faith, and he's looking, and that's what he's going to Will he find faith? faith when he comes back to this earth. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Then we look in the epistles. Go all the way to Jude, all the letters in the epistles that were written by the apostles. It's interesting because I plugged it into the computer in a search engine and there were over 180 references, 18 pages of stuff that just came print. I didn't print it out, but I could have printed it out. 18 pages just on faith. That's not including words like trust and believe and things that have references or inferences. Faith is a part of that. That's an absolute miracle when you look at that. The, the Apostle John says faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith is your victory. Somebody says, oh, I need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's your power, but faith turns the switch. That's the thing that makes the power work. Holy Spirit is needed, but you cannot use the power of the Holy Spirit until you believe and activate your faith. Very, very vital to our Christian life and our Christian experience. Now, I just wanted to mention this stuff to you this morning. I wanted to get you pumped up to know that you need your faith increased. And then next week, I want to talk to, to you about how to grow your faith and how to activate it. One way, faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? Okay, that's fine. That helps you know, but you can even know and still not activate. You can have it in your head and not in your heart and not in your life. I'm going to break it down next week, point by point by point, and I'm going to spend some time on it, and I believe that we're going to see it. But right now, I want everybody to realize and ask yourself, is my faith what it needs to be right now? Just think about it. Is my faith where it needs to be? Is my faith what I want it to be? Have I made a deposit of my faith into my faith so that when something comes, I don't fall apart, but I have that peace? Will I fall apart or will I stand and say, I don't care what it looks like. I've got faith. I know my God. 
Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. God will never leave me. He's not forsaken. Do you have that kind of faith right now? Or are you going, ooh, I don't know. I need a little bit more of the sermon. Preach a little bit more. I'm not there yet. You're going to need more than my sermon. You're going to need to get in touch with God. You're going to need to press in. You're going to need to deposit. And you can. God created you, put the spirit within you, but he's looking for faith. The, the thing that he's looking for when he comes to the end of the age, will there be any faith? That blew my mind. I knew that scripture, but I hadn't thought about it, especially with the kind of things that are going to hit the end of the age. I need to increase my faith. God has allowed me to go through some things these last couple of weeks that my faith has to grow. I realized I had not given deposit. You know, we're kind of lazy. Things just kind of come our way. We make it. We pay the basic bills. Who needs God? We can do this. I love God, but I'm not having to activate my faith when things are like that. You don't like what I'm going to say. Guess what? Trials come. So you'll not just believe, but you'll activate your faith, and it will work for you. How many of you say, you know what? I've got several of those things already that I have to have some faith for. How many of you have some things that you can't do it without God and without faith? I think every one of us here have that. It's time to get that faith in our hearts. I just wanted to say something simple this Memorial Day weekend. I didn't want to fill you with a bunch of heavy things, except I want you to be looking at your own self. Where is my faith level? On a 1 to 10 right now, where would you say your faith level is? Is it a 10? If it is, please fly up here and pray for us all. We appreciate you being here today. Is it a 9? Is it an 8? Maybe a 5? I dare say there are many in here, perhaps, that are in church today who love God. You love God. But your faith is on a two. Your faith might even be on a one. You believe that there is a God and you know he loves you, but do you believe he'll do it for you? Last week, what do we call it? Wheelbarrow faith. Remember that story? The guy that was a true story, Niagara Falls, that was walking on the tightrope across Niagara Falls, and it went on and on and drew crowds. He finally announced he was going to do something tremendously unbelievable. He was going to not just walk on that tightrope, but he was going to push a wheelbarrow with a man in it, somebody in it, across. And there were people laughing at him, but he went into the little restaurant. He heard somebody talking. He said, I believe he can do it. I bet $100 he can do it. And he walks up to him, and he says, man, I'm so glad you believe in me because I'm still looking for the guy that is going to be in the wheelbarrow when I push him over. I want you to do it. And what happened? The guys suddenly didn't believe in him anymore. We believe real good if we don't have to get in the wheelbarrow. But faith is getting in the wheelbarrow. As long as God is pushing, I'm fine. You, you maybe not so much. But God... I believe God, or I want to believe God. Now, we all have things that we believe for. And, you know, I was thinking of a scripture where it said, which is harder? Remember when Jesus healed on the Sabbath? He says, which is harder, for the Son of Man to forgive sins or for, to heal somebody? And for us, the harder is the thing that we see, isn't it? Healing somebody that we actually see physically, that would be harder than to say your sins are forgiven. But not for Jesus. Actually, the harder thing for Jesus was forgiving sins because it took the life of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. That was harder. Saying be healed was nothing to, Je to God. For us, the hard things are what we see. To God, the bigger price and the harder thing for him was sending his son, Jesus. I'm trying to say that to you to know that if it is easy in your mind for God to forgive your sins through Jesus... It's easier, actually, for Jesus to supply finances, to heal your body. That's easier for God, in a sense, than sending his son and going through all he went and the pain and the sacrifice to forgive your sin. It's nothing to God. God can do it. What he's looking for is faith. Well, that's what you preachers are for. You need to pray more and have some faith and have some miracle services so we can get our healing. No. I thank God for the gifts that flow through people, and they flowed through people through the years. But the day has now come that we are going to have to have our own faith experience and not depend on some superstar that walks in and waves a wand and blows on us, and we fall over and suddenly get our healing. No, you're going to have to have your own faith because in these last days, the times are harder than they're ever going to be, and your faith has to be activated.
It's not about some superstar. It's about you knowing the God of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and knowing if you put your faith and your trust in him, nothing is impossible. I love the song we're singing. I think we need to sing it again. I want you to come. I'm going to end the service early. I want to pray for you. Everybody that says, oh, Lord, here's your cry. Increase my faith. I want you to stand right now, and I want to pray with you and for you, but you need to learn to activate it yourself. Increase my faith, Lord. Increase my faith level. Stand. Holy Spirit, your power is in us. The life of God is all around us. You've not changed. You're the same God that multiplied food for the 5,000, and you're living in our world today. I pray, God, that the power that raised Christ from the dead can quicken our mortal bodies. How? By faith. Help us understand what faith is and what we should do with it, how we activate it, how we act upon it, for faith without works is dead. I thank you, Father, just for this line upon line teaching that will make us understand that some of the things that are not happening in our lives, it's not because you don't want to do them. You're waiting for somebody to believe you. You're waiting for somebody to act in faith and get in the wheelbarrow. Because when you come and the end of this age is done and the things of this earth will be no more, the thing you'll be looking for is not have we done a bunch of good things outwardly. You're looking, is there anybody on this earth that has, still has faith in me? So God help us. Everybody just lift your voice just a moment and say, Lord, please increase my faith. Help me be stronger and, and believe you more and act in faith and walk in faith and have the peace that faith.